Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Frances Ruan. I'm a member of the Council of the IIEA, and I've been asked this afternoon to chair this session, which is a lot of, a lot of richness. I know some of you have been here for an earlier session, so this is a very rich day. Uh, the issue, I think, of, of, um, of Brexit is an issue that never fails to deliver more for us to talk about. Uh, and obviously, this past weekend is, 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 is a case in point. So, what uh, I'm going to the first session is basically um, I'm asking, we're asking um, Dahlia Khali, who is is a former ambassador to the UK and is head of the of the UK group here in the in the institute, uh, to give, as it were, an update. I think his update probably before the weekend would have been based on the previous week's activities, but obviously the past the past week has give, given more. So um, he's going to, to deliver um, an address to you, uh, and then we'll have a Q&A. And as always in the, in the Institute, the address is, is, uh, is open to repetition, is, is, is not covered by the Chatham House rule, but the discussion afterwards is, even though I think uh, very often people will be quite comfortable with issues traveling further, but I think we should all respect the Chatham House rule in that regard. So in other words, anything that gets said here the idea can be repeated, but without attribution to the person involved, or in fact the event specifically, because it becomes more obvious in that case. So um, I'm going to ask Thahi to, to, uh, to make his presentation to you, and then we'll have a, a good length of time for Q&A, because I think he feels that a lot of the issues that have come up, you know, in some sense it's best to respond to questions rather than spending a lot of time. I've asked him specifically to address some of the issues that have actually come out of the, of the Czech Statement, because while many of you will have read it, not all of you will have necessarily digested it, and he'll have a context and a framework for thinking about that. So final point to say is please turn off your mobile phones before we start. Thank you. Afternoon. It's a... <clears throat> Uh, when, when we published this book three and a half years ago in the Institute, uh, it was edited by Paul Gillespie and myself, we said that we lived in times of great uncertainty and uh, unpredictability. I think we're still in those times, except that it's now been joined with the possibility of chaos. Um, the negotiations between the EU and the United Kingdom, as we all know, have been effectively at a halt for a considerable period, really since last December. Uh, so what I want to do now for a very short period, because I'd much prefer to engage with you, is just to say something about the, the political syst system in the United Kingdom and the, polit the political conditions in the United Kingdom, firstly, and then secondly, maybe just have a look at the statement which came out of Chequers last Friday and see, see what, it, what it all means. Um, the Tory party and the supporters of the Tory party in the United Kingdom are split down the middle. And the same, to some extent, is true of the British uh, Labour Party. Now, if you look at the results of the referendum, leave aside Scotland, leave aside Northern Ireland, the actual majority in favour of Brexit in England, which is where it matters, uh, is much higher than it is for the United Kingdom as a whole. Uh, and I think that vote in England represents a political reality in England. They were never particularly happy in continental, in tying themselves to the continent. They were never particularly happy as members of the European Union. And they had a very special deal within the European Union, which no other state had. And the union was prepared in the final negotiations with Cameron uh, to give them more, but yet they still rejected it. I think there is a deep-seated English nationalism that's reflected in this referendum, which goes back to the old imperial days of wherever, but I think it's fundamentally, I think it's English, English nationalism. The Tory party is split ideologically as a result. Uh, if you've been looking, for example, over the last few days at interviews with Rhys Mogg or interviews with uh, Duncan Smith or interviews with Redwood, those people are not open to discussion. They're not open to dialogue. They're ideologues. Um, now, the question is, what will they do? Uh, they were stuck uh, for a long time 
uh, in the negotiations uh, with Europe, and there effectively had been no advance, uh, very little advance, since uh, last December. Most sensible people in the British government realised that. And what happened in Chequers was, uh, it, and it didn't come easily, it took Mrs May two years to get to Chequers, uh, what happened in Chequers was a realisation by the British government, as is actually said in the statement, that they needed to put something new, <coughs> something developed on the table in order to enter uh, into negotiations. Uh, we saw Davis resigning last night. Will others resign? I'm inclined to think not. I'm inclined to think that Boris Johnson, were he to resign, would have resigned first. I may be wrong. Will the party split at this stage? Again, I'm inclined to think not. Uh, Rees Mogg last week uh, threatened Mrs. May by referring to the split in the Conservative Party in, I think, 1846 on the repeal of the Corn Laws. He made no reference as to why the British government was trying to repeal the Corn Laws at that stage. It was in order to allow cheap food into Ireland to deal with the famine. Um, I think the main reason why they won't split at this, at this time, and again I could be totally wrong, is a gentleman called Corbyn. They are terrified that they might lose the next election. Duncan Smith, quoted in yesterday's Sunday Telegraph, said that he expected that the Tory vote would be down 25% in the next election as a result of the agreement in Chequers. So it gives you some, some notion of what's driving these people forward. Now, if he's saying that and he's a leading Brexiteer, is he likely to split the party, cause an election, and let Corbyn in? I doubt it. So my guess will be that they won't split. My guess will be that they will in a large measure, reflect in the white paper, which is due out later this week, uh, the main principles which were agreed at Chequers, and that they will seek to engage with the European Union on that basis. Um, let me just, I don't know how many of you have read the statement, but what's behind it is very clear. It is, we have failed so far to engage with the European Union in a way which would provide for a useful basis for going forward. And therefore, we have to bring, provide for the Europeans uh, a, a more, I just, he said, the position needed to evolve in order to provide a precise, responsible, and credible basis for progressing negotiations. So there is an acceptance here that they had to move and it, it, it was very difficult, I think, for Mrs. May to get here. Uh, and it's been highly choreographed over the last two or three months. And I think, and I prefer not to hear this outside, I think Ollie Robbins' hand is all over it. Um, so the statement says that the government will publish a white paper <coughs> setting out this proposal in detail. But in summary, there are four main elements. The first is a common rule book for all goods, including agri-food. So free movement of goods. The second one is reciprocal commitments related to open and fair trade. Uh, they talk about a common rule book on state aid. Now, if you remember the arguments for Brexit, one of them very strongly was that they would be able to break away from those state aid rules in order to provide themselves with uh, more attractive uh, goods for export. Cooperative arrangements between regulators on competition, including commitments to upholding international standards, and that they wouldn't let future standards fall before the current levels. Then they talk about a consistent interpretation and application of UK-EU agreements. And there's space here for uh, the European Court of Justice. 
And then they come back to the thing that was already on the table, which is a facilitated customs uh, agreement. Now, I think there is enough there to enable discussions to move on. Uh, and I think both the UK at this stage and the EU, they really need to move those discussions on because time is getting, getting very short. What's very, there's also a slight change of, of tone. The tone I felt uh, from Britain over the last two years has been, it's been an internal debate with itself uh, whereby they, they mentioned what they would like and they thought whatever they liked uh, would be given to them pretty much willy-nilly. I think they've learned very much over the last 21 months that to some extent this is an unequal negotiation, that the, the other member states are actually stronger than the United Kingdom. It's been quite striking how this negotiation has been carried out by the European Commission, and particularly by Barnier. And the principles which were established earlier on, they've not moved from them. And I think it's been very good from a European point of view in the sense that the British have had to change the negotiating stance and get themselves to where they are now. What's likely to happen? I don't know. Uh, there certainly is not enough here uh, from a European perspective. Uh, there is an acceptance that some of these positions will change as the negotiations go on. But I think by and large, I think it is an acceptance by the United Kingdom government uh, that the stance that they had in the past needed to change. And as far as I can see, I think she's brought most of her cabinet uh, with her. Um, but there are, a lot, there are a lot of occasions uh, between now and the end of the year, or between now, say, in March, April next year, uh, where she could fall. There will be votes on customs uh, this side of the summer in the House of Commons. And then when all of this stuff comes back to the Commons and the Lords in October, November, um, there's a lot of stuff to be done. Um, if any of you, for example, saw yesterday's Sunday Telegraph, there were three or four pages of vitriol against the British government. It was quite astonishing. Vitriol. Um, but I think it's come, I think it's come to, the, to the point where the British government has to make its mind up. Uh, I think, frankly, she's done a reasonably good job, and I think they have decided uh, to negotiate uh, on a more realistic basis than they did in the past. Having said that, I think there is something else that has happened within the United Kingdom, and that is the vast bulk of those people in the House of Commons who were Remainers and probably still are Remainers, I think they have accepted that Brexit is going to happen. I don't think there is that many anymore within the House of Commons who feel that, at this stage anyway, that they can remain in. I think there is an acceptance, a much wider acceptance now than there might have been, that Brexit is going to happen. And I think what they will argue for, particularly in the autumn, is the softest possible Brexit. And at the end of the day, that's in our interest. Thank you. So the first paper we're going to have is from um, Con Lucy, and it's on the agri-food sector, which we know is, is an absolutely crucial, crucial sector for Ireland, our biggest trading sector with Northern Ireland and the UK and, and, and the EU, with, with them products travelling in, in both directions, and in particular products <coughs> travelling to Europe via the land bridge through the, through the UK. So I'll ask uh, Con to make his, his, his statement. And just remember that, again, the, um, where, where the discussion is... Um, Discussion is on the record, are you saying? It's discussion is on the record. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks, <Sir> Francis. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, in this paper, I look at the broad options for a post-Brexit EU-UK trade relationship uh, and assess how they will affect 
the agri-food sector. And I suppose, as you may guess, things are generally more complex in the agri-food sector in Europe than for the general uh, other non, uh, the, the general industrial sector, for example. And I suppose the special factors I mentioned are, first of all, the EU common agricultural policy relies very heavily on the customs union and particularly the common external tariff, which provides relatively high protection for a range of products, particularly the ones we're very dependent on, like beef and dairy products. The single market is also important because, of course, we have common regulation uh, for food safety, animal health, plant health, environment. Now, just looking then at the immediate issue of the UK leaving, the UK is only 52% self-sufficient for food. Imports from the EU, the rest of the EU, account for about 30% of that market. So you can see there's potential for big disruption. Now, Irish agri-food exports have a relatively high dependence on the UK, and that's set out in the table uh, in, in the paper. As the chairperson mentioned, the island of Ireland has a highly integrated agri-food market. And finally, and not unimportantly in my view, is that we shouldn't forget that prior to EEC membership, the UK operated a cheap food policy based on liberal imports from around the world. <clears throat> now, future risks can be grouped under three broad headings. <clears throat> the first are the obvious ones, which are tariffs, <coughs> me, regulatory checks, country of origin checks, and administrative delays. Maybe less obvious, though, is depending on what the UK do in the future, there's the risk of possible reduction in the value of the UK food market. And also down the road, there is a risk of destabilization in the UK 27 food market. Now, I look at three separate, st fairly standalone options here. And I'm sure you can well appreciate that this was written long before last Friday. So um, I won't be spe specifically referring to that. Uh, option A essentially is straightforward. The UK would either stay in the customs union or agree a new customs union agreement with the uh, EU. Both I mentioned that that would really need to observe the EU common external tariff. And in addition to that, there would also be a regulatory, a regulatory alignment between the UK and the EU. So in that situation, it's very straightforward. There would be no tariffs in, on EU, UK trade, no need for regulatory or country of origin checks at the border, and the value of the UK food market would be maintained. And from the agri-food perspective, that obviously is the satisfactory option the second option, which may be more likely in practice, is essentially based on a UK-EU free trade agreement, but one that would allow the UK to operate an independent global trade policy. And on the positive side, that generally would remove the need for tariffs on trade. Now, regulatory borders would, uh, controls would still be needed, unless, of course, you sup supplemented that agreement, but also an agreement on regulatory alignment. Now, what you would need, though, which would be a new dimension, is country of origin checks at the border to distinguish between products that generally came from the UK and products that have just been transited through the UK. There would be a particular problem uh, as well and that is one of trade displacement. In other words, the UK under that situation, if they wished, could decide to export all their own farm produce to the EU and supply their home market by um, imports from the world stage. So I think very quickly there would be calls for import quotas to apply on exports from the UK to the EU and probably vice versa. There's also the big risk in that scenario of the loss of value in the UK market. And you know, free trade might sound 
very benign and friendly, but a free trade policy is you know, far from a good outcome. Obviously, the, the precise effect would depend on the details, but you know, as I said, it sounds friendly, but not necessarily uh, a good outcome. Option C, and I mean, there's, from what Stoy said and others, I mean, there is a clear risk of a no-deal scenario whereby we will be reliant on the WTO rules. By the way, if you want to know anything about how WTO works, as Stoy sometime apparently is, well, it says he was a former ambassador, and it works very slowly and very poorly, as I understand it most of the time. So in that option C, essentially you would have WTO rules in place, you'd have tariffs on trade in both directions between Ireland and the UK, you would have regulatory controls on imports in the UK. <clears throat> the, complex part, the complex part, I think, is that over time, the UK could reduce its import tariffs, either on the basis of the general most favoured nations clause, or even more negative from our point of view, that they could go off and do special uh, free trade deals with supplier countries around the world. So in that scenario, apart from all the complexities at the border, <coughs> there is also the risk that the UK would no longer be a worthwhile market for the U27. But on top of that, bearing in mind, as I said, that Europe, including Ireland, supplies almost 30% of that market at the moment. That would need to find a new home. So there's also the risk of very substantial destabilization of the EU27 market. So I'll stop at that, Chairman. Thank you. When, when you look at the, at the merchandise trade data, the thing that's really striking in terms of the island is just how much trade is in the agri-food area and how much the crossover relationships are there within that, within that area. Uh, so it's, 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 uh, it's probably of all the ones, it has the most immediate impact, and this, we'll come back to this in, 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 at a later paper, but it, it has the most impact on both consumers and producers because you're talking about products that actually, you can't decide to, you might decide to defer buying a washing machine until next year, but you actually can't decide to defer food until next year or a particular kind of food. Um, our second paper is, is um, on, on the single, um, energy market, and this is, is work done by, by Joe, Joe Curtin, uh, who's a senior uh, fellow here at the IAEA and a member of the Climate Change Advisory Council. And just to those of you who are not maybe familiar with it, the paper is around for people to get it, and of course it's on the website, but the, 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 single, mar the single energy market project has been one of the big successes of, the, of creating a sense of the island having the scale uh, that it can operate to, 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 to a way that it didn't have, have previously. And the benefits of that have been around cost to consumers and also about security of supply. Now, even ahead of Brexit, we were already heading to more challenging topics in that area because of what's being done with the European uh, energy market uh, and that has to be done and then on top of that we now get, get Brexit. So Joe's paper gives an outline of some of the issues that are involved in that. Joe. Thank you very much Chair <coughs> for the introduction. Um, as, as per the introduction, I'm going to focus on the electricity sector, so I won't be talking about the gas sector today, which is equally important. Um, but one caveat before I begin, I haven't directly been involved in Brexit negotiations, um, uh, much, like, uh, much as you might suspect, so I'm bringing today a sort of a, a, an outsider's perspective looking in. So um, that caveat aside, um, the background, of course, as Francis said, is that the single electricity market was launched in 2007, and this is a jointly regulated and operated um, electricity market covering the island of Ireland, and it arises from the Good Friday Agreement. So, um, as Francis said, it's been one of the key success stories of the Good Friday Agreement, and if not the um, standout uh, substantive and successful area of collaboration between North and South. Um, this new market has been also very successful, as Francis said, uh, stealing my thunder, thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> in the three pillars of energy policy, which energy and climate policy people talk about, competitiveness, security of supply, and uh, sustainability or decarbonisation, 
So it's of considerable economic and political significance. Um, and the two, be, the two immediate challenges facing the market are, first of all, that there's this European target model, which arises from the EU's third energy package, and this seeks to integrate, further integrate electricity markets across the EU. And this is why the so-called ISAM, which is the integrated electricity market, um, is coming on stream. And it's scheduled to come on stream in October 2018. And this will be compliant with the new, the new EU rules. And the second big um, thing on the horizon to look out for is the north-south interconnector, because there's congestion in terms of electricity trade between north and south. There's a limit of three, 300 megawatts, and there's a demand for approximately 1,100 megawatts of trade in electricity north and south. So moving on um, to consider how Brexit would affect the, um, the ISM and electricity markets within the context of these two big picture developments. So there's been strong ind indications from all actors that ISEM should and will be sustained. The draft withdrawal agreement, for example, which was published in March, suggested that there would be that there was a political agreement to maintain um, this uh, EU's to, for the UK to maintain membership of the EU single electricity market. But of course, the devil is always in the detail in terms of how these political commitments are realised. And I want to focus just on the hard Brexit scenario which is the one that obviously gives rise to the greatest difficulties, where singles market, uh, single market and customs union membership are not maintained. Um, and ISEM could be particularly vulnerable in this scenario with regulatory divergence. Um, and the harder the Brexit, of course, the greater the regulatory divergence, the greater the pressures to ISEM. Um, and in the medium term, this is because ISEM would have to comply, obviously, with all um, current and future electricity market uh, regulation emanating from Brussels. And this would fall under the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice. So if ISEM were maintained, but the UK leaves the single electricity market, it doesn't take a genius to work out that this is going to cause issues. Um, so one solution would be to um, designate special status for Northern Ireland. In this case, the UK would have to accept potential regulatory divergence between the two parts of the United Kingdom, which, and we all know the red lines around that, particularly up north. Um, and it would create a very unusual situation where Mes Westminster would actually have to transpose EU directives first dormant, um, because dormant doesn't have that competence, um, but which would not reply in the UK. So we can all imagine the political um, tensions that that might create, and I think we can question the political sustainability of that kind of arrangement. So the other, we'll say, more optimal option, within a, even within a hard Brexit scenario, would be to maintain or to pursue market integration between the ISEM, which is Ireland, Northern Ireland, and the UK to create one electricity market, North and South. And this would be modeled on the Nord Pool, which is an electric, a Nordic electricity market. Uh, but the question around this is, if it would be acceptable to the UK hardliners, um, and indeed, would it be acceptable to the European Commission, which, as we know, has ruled out cherry-picking aspects of the single market which suit the UK. So problems about both of those uh, potential solutions. So in conclusion, a hard Brexit, um, in a hard Brexit, the ISEM could come under increasing pressure over time. Chair, if I might be allowed um, a few more two minutes? minutes? Two, two minutes. minutes, perfect. Uh, so moving on to interconnection. As noted, there's an urgent requirement for greater interconnection between North and South, but there's actually three interconnection projects which are currently being considered at the moment, and these are called projects of common interest, um, and they have the full support of the EU institutions, and they're at various stages of planning. The North-South interconnector has jumped through most of the legislative and regulatory hurdles that it's faced at the moment, and so the conclusion of the paper is that Brexit itself won't likely pose significant hurdles in the way of the north-south interconnector. That's not to say that there aren't other challenges that this interconnector, this vital infrastructure faces, but the north side, that Brexit isn't one of them. The second interconnector that's being planned at the moment is the Celtic interconnector to connect the ISEM with France, and the third interconnector is to the UK. And long story short, the paper suggests, you won't be surprised, that for two reasons, um, Brexit may affect the um, costs and benefits of these projects in various ways. So the first one is that projects of common interest need to be between two member states. So of course there could be project finance issues um, affecting further east-west interconnectors. The second is that Brexit 
likely increases the probability that there will be sustained electricity market divergence between the UK and the EU electricity prices. And this will create an incentive for Ireland to manage that risk of overexposure to uh, UK electricity prices, and again would largely uh, tend to suggest that it would increase the attractiveness of building greater interconnection, or any interconnection actually, to the mainland European um, electricity market. So to conclude very briefly, in the short term, Brexit is unlikely to affect the two big things on the horizon that I mentioned, the North-South Interconnector and the launch of the ISM in October. But in the medium term, there could be um, issues arising from a hard Brexit um, and a regulatory divergence, and it could also affect the attractiveness of building in infrastructure projects between uh, the UK, vis-a-vis -vis the UK and the EU. Thank you very much. And our third paper today is, is a, a paper by um, Edgar Morganroth and John Fitzgerald, and it's been presented by Edgar. It's focusing on the distribution sector, which, as I mentioned, related to the agri-food sector, is one of the, the big areas where there's going to be a huge impact on Ireland. So, Edgar. Thank you, Francis, and good afternoon. Uh, as Francis says, it's a paper jointly authored with John Fitzgerald, who can't be here, so you can blame him for anything you don't like, and anything that you do like is obviously mine. Uh, I, I, uh, I start with, with a more general sort of point, and, and this is kind of important, not just in the context of Brexit. Um, a lot of the discussion that we have seen over the last uh, couple of years uh, following the referendum has been about exports our exports are going to be hit, and that's the only way we're going to suffer. And it's a very much a mercantilist view, and it's pretty much the view that actually Donald Trump holds. Uh, he only looks at merchandise trade and only looks at exports. And we forget that there are services and we import things as well. And we know uh, from th trade theory that particularly small countries uh, also need to import a lot. So when you look at the work that I have done going a number of years back now, five years I've been working on Brexit, I've always looked at imports and exports. And that includes the chapter in this book uh, here that uh, we published at the IAEA. And what we're talking about in this paper is, is really the imports uh, uh, dimension, and particularly in relation to distribution. So we actually import more, uh, a greater share of our imports from the UK than we export there. And any trade barriers that might arise from Brexit are going to hit our imports just as they're going to hit our exports. So what's the implication of that? Now, there are a number of different uh, uh, ways in which this is going to potentially hit. And there are also different types of, of sectors. So on the one hand, we've got consumer products, things we buy in our shops. On the other hand, we've got uh, intermediate inputs that go into manufacturing things like raw milk coming from Northern Ireland for further processing in the Republic of Ireland. That's the sort of uh, uh, supply chain interconnectedness that Con referred to earlier. Uh, so we've got consumers, we've got producers. Uh, both could potentially take uh, a hit if there are trade barriers, just through imports. Um, and what we have done in this paper is really to review some of the evidence that is out there on, on this issue and also added some of our own thoughts on this. And when it comes to the consumer side in particular, it's very interesting because the open borders and the fact that we have a single market has allowed the distribution sector, and particularly retail, to change its model of, of supply considerably. Uh, because you can have a lorry load of all sorts of different products coming across a border freely. Whereas once you have a customs regime, you now have to declare every individual product separately, and it has to be testable. So if a customs official stops the lorry and wants to check whether you really have 10 boxes of whatever it is, cornflakes, on the truck, you've got to take them out. And that makes it really, really difficult for uh, uh, retailers in particular uh, if there were to, uh, uh, to continue uh, uh, supplying directly from the UK to Ireland. And let's face it, UK retailers have a very dominant role in our uh, 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 retail sector. 
And we've recently done some work with a colleague, uh, uh, Martina Lawless at the ESRI, which has looked at the potential impact of both the tariff barriers that might come and uh, non-tariff barriers, which actually turn out to be more important. Of course, that's all in the context of a hard Brexit. It was obviously done before uh, the recent uh, uh, Chequers meeting, although I'm a bit of a pessimist in, any, in general when it comes to Brexit, so I'm still not convinced that I'm wrong on this. Uh, and it shows that we could end up having uh, an increase in consumer prices, prices in the shops by 3% maybe 4%, not insubstantial. And that's also in line with the evidence that we see from the US and Canada border, where the border there adds 2.7% to, uh, to prices. And that's before we've looked at the competitiveness effects on our industry. And those, for those, we don't have estimates as yet. So these are really, really important uh, 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 and significant shocks uh, to the Irish economy and two Irish consumers, uh, and they're not exports. And I'll finish, uh, and I think hopefully I'm in time, the last sentence. One thing I, I, I think is really, really important to remember, even in, you know, checkers, uh, whether it's, ex you know, before or after checkers, doesn't matter. Theresa May has always said she wants a deep and special relationship with the EU. What that really means is, because she has the deepest and most special relationship that you can have, what she wants is a less deep and less special relationship with the EU. So whatever the Brexit is going, whatever Brexit we're going to get, it's definitely going to be worse. And I'll finish there. Thanks. So those of us who don't, who don't necessarily approve of this, of the Twitter sphere, is uh, it's a point where it's, it's highly relevant. Uh, can we just, can we just, we come back. That'd be quite. We can come back to Boris at the end. Um, uh, I think, I think, I think Edgar's paper is actually something which all of us can appreciate as we've seen it change, depending on what age you are in the room but how deliveries to supermarkets are now made by large trucks late in the evening. Those trucks actually combining all those different varieties of things. And it's only because of the single market and the customs union that that could happen. And it's particularly following the single market that that has become hugely popular because of standards and regulation issues not being, 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 being such. So it's, 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 a, it's kind of a reminder in all our lives of, of, of exactly that particular, particular impact. Um, our final speaker, it's not related to a paper, because the papers are around the room. I see that you have copies of them that has been issued by the Institute. But this, this uh, final speaker is Rena Dwyer from the, the um, uh, Enterprise Ireland. And Rena was at the IFA. She followed Khan uh, over many years and was there as their economist. And she relatively recently joined uh, Enterprise Ireland. And Enterprise Ireland, if you like, is sort of at the heart of responding to some of the issues, not the, not the electricity issue, but the, but the, the distribution issues, the, the food and the other trade issues that are, that, that are, 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 are relevant to Ireland. Um, but I think what is, what is the case is that Enterprise Ireland is trying to play a tricky role because we can't just go out and help every firm to cope with what might be scenario one, two, or three of the types that have been mentioned now. And I think their approach has been around looking at you know, what, what I think people like Edgar would have referred to as the, the, the uh, no regrets strategies. What are the things that firms can be doing to increase their sustainability, their resilience, their ability to cope with whatever the outturn is? And I suppose business has been, on the one hand, wanting to get the best outturn, but on the other hand, recognizing that a long period of uncertainty is actually for it itself a cost, a big damage for it that, 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 that needs to be taken into account. So, Rowena. So thank you very much, Chairman, and thank you very much to the IIA for asking me to speak today, not least of which it's the first time I get to share a platform with Con Lucy, which means an awful lot to me. But anyway, I'm here today to talk about, uh, just give an overview of the work that's being undertaken by Enterprise Ireland to support companies to respond to the challenges of Brexit. So I suppose for anyone who wants to know Enterprise Ireland, what we do, we work with Irish exporting agencies to start, to innovate, and to remain competitive in international markets now and hopefully into the future. And 
If you take our strategy from 2017 to 2020, we set out some fairly ambitious targets. One was to assist our clients to create 60,000 new jobs between now and 2020, to grow our exports by 5 billion euros, to increase the level of spend by our, economies, our, our companies in the economy, to increase their level of R&I expenditure, and then to inspire more of our Irish-owned companies to have global ambition. And building on this in 2017, in May 2017, and in response to Brexit, we set out a Eurozone strategy where we very specifically looked at trying to assist our Irish exporters in a pretty kind of difficult way to increase our exports to Eurozone countries by 50% by 2020. We have approximately 5,000 companies on the books, if you want to call it that, and they're supported through a, market, um, a network of market and sector advisors across 10 national offices and 33 international offices. And why does Brexit matter to these companies? Because actually Irish-owned enterprises, as of 2016, approximately 35% of our exports still go to the UK. There's been huge market diversification. A decade ago, that was actually about 45%, but it still shows the huge importance of the UK market. And these manufacturing and internationally traded services companies are a critical source of employment in Ireland and job creation across the whole of Ireland. If you take 2017, for example, we are, our client companies had their best employment figures ever. Over 209,000 people are employed in Enterprise Ireland companies. And we actually grew, and I was told it was the first time it ever happened, growth in our client companies across all regions, across all counties, and across all sectors. Always in the past, no matter how good things were, some county dropped the ball. But uh, no, I suppose what I'm really saying is that, you know, reflecting the growth in the international economy and in the Irish economy, 2017 was a very good year. And then you looked into 2018, and you're talking about well, what to do in, in the face of all this uncertainty. How do you really respond to Brexit? So our focus is firmly, it's a long-term thing, on helping clients to build resilience to economic shocks in general, such as those emerging from any kind of Brexit. How are we doing this? Well, the focus is on three key areas. Can we support our companies to innovate, to be competitive, and to diversify their global footprint? And we're doing this by introducing new supports and streamlining the ones that we already have. So under the whole area of market diversification, a key part of that is getting companies into markets, getting companies speaking to buyers and so on. So we have a record number of trade missions this year, and we have 200 international and domestic trade events scheduled throughout the year. We also introduced in early 2018 the Market Discovery Fund, and this is a fund to, re to support companies to research viable and sustainable market entry strategies in new geographic markets. Because anyone who's involved in exporting knows it is hard to get into a new market, and it's hard to stay in a new market as well. So the purpose of the Market Discovery Fund is to support companies to have a strategic approach to trying to diversify into new markets. And also recognising the critical importance of the UK market still, we've been looking at the opportunities that are there in the UK still, a great example being the Northern Powerhouse and the plans that the UK has, and what sectors under that do we, do we see potential for our clients. I mentioned already innovation. It's essential for companies. It is the jam on top, where you are not just competitive, but you actually hold your market share, you command a price that allows a company from Ireland to be competitive globally. And we work with our clients both to support uh, in-company R&D, but really importantly to also collaborate with the higher education sector to drive innovation. And this ranges from everything because, you know, sometimes I think people might think innovation or research and innovation is something that only larger companies can do. This goes all the way from a 5,000 euro innovation voucher where uh, a company and, a, and, and an institute of technology can do a small targeted piece of research all the way through to our 14 industry-led technology centres, which are large centres where industry, whether it's the Meat Technology Centre or the Centre for Applied Data Analytics, are, 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 are supporting research on cross-sectoral or within-sector uh, research that can actually help the entire sector to move up the value chain. And again, just looking at what companies were saying to us, Enterprise Ireland introduced in late 2017 the new Agile Innovation Fund to allow, I suppose, a quicker turnaround time and more targeted uh, in-company research to look at new processes and new markets. 
And then, of course, competitiveness. A renewed focus on competitiveness is something that has been key to the Brexit response because there are going to be cost challenges arising from Brexit. So companies are being supported to look at their operational efficiency through lean competitiveness programs, investing in their capital infrastructure, and then, critically importantly, investing in green and sustainable infrastructure. So in terms of then kind of more targeted, the things you'd hear about Brexit, Brexit responses. Since 2016, we have had a continuous program of actions on the areas of Brexit supports. And because Brexit is uncertain, the key aim has been to promote awareness among companies. So that's the first thing, just get them thinking about it. And then to encourage action in areas that they can control that are specifically impacted by Brexit. Three of the key business areas we have focused our supports are financial and currency management, strategic sourcing, because as Edgar mentioned, the whole issue of the impact on imports and the impact and the key role that imports actually play on our export diversification is something that, that, that I suppose um, is, it's important for companies to think about their exposure in terms of their import exposure as well. And then customs, transport and logistics. We have had a national prepare for Brexit campaign. And under this, as I said, there's been a continuous uh, program of actions and, and supports introduced, including things like the Brexit SME scorecard, which has allowed companies, not just Enterprise Ireland companies, but companies to uh, go online and assess their level of Brexit exposure. And then the offering of a Be Prepared grant to support companies to actually, once they know their exposure, to start to put in place a plan to try and mitigate their risks. We have had action plan um, clinics around the country, six so far and four scheduled. And it's very interesting to see Brexit advisory clinics, the numbers of companies are growing, the numbers of companies engaging and really getting into the position where they're taking action to manage the risks that they can is growing, with a huge focus on uh, the customs and logistics piece. Because there is the issue, the reality of it is, we are talking about um, dealing with a third country outside of the EU and what that practically might mean. Um, I should also mention, I suppose, as well, that companies that do not fall under the Enterprise Ireland uh, banner, companies of a smaller scale but who are kind of getting to that level, the local enterprise office supports um, these for, for, for the Brexit supports. And many of the supports that Enterprise Ireland have, has developed, as you're aware, have been extended and are kind of right-sized for companies who are under the local enterprise office pillar. It shows, I suppose, as well, the importance of actually having a joined up approach to this and making sure that our supports are consistent to our companies. <coughs> our response has also incorporated the development of our first international media campaign called the Irish Advantage, if any of you have seen it. It's a, it's a great campaign. I, I'm not a media person at all, but it's a lead generation digital campaign, and it has been targeted at buyers in countries in different sectors. So perhaps, actually, because you're not international buyers, you won't have been aware of it. But it's a really targeted value proposition to international buyers as to why they should be uh, 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 sourcing their, their, their materials, their services from our Irish, Irish companies. And then in addition to that, the government has, of course, sanctioned in, past, in the past number of budgets additional funding for personnel, both here and overseas. Chairman, I'm going to conclude now to say that Enterprise Ireland is, is very aware that further efforts are needed to ensure that companies are resilient to the economic shocks presented by things such as Brexit. We're really, we've moved in 2018 to support companies to take action and manage in as far as possible the risks and challenges presented by Brexit. And we'll continue to work with our companies to drive their innovation, their competitiveness and the, their, their diversification, fundamentally to help them to have the key attributes of internationally competitive companies. Thank you very much. So before we open the floor, I'm minded by, by Irina's comments to make, to make two points. Uh, one is that um, we'll talk about clouds and silver linings. I think one of the silver, few silver linings in the Brexit cloud, which is very dark, is that actually it has shifted our thinking to the more medium to long term. I think one of the effects of the financial crisis was that everybody became looking at the end of the quarter, looking at the end of the six month and looking at the end of the year. And in some sense, this, the Brexit shock, both in the case of government, I think, and in the case of, of, of enterprises, got them out of that. They realized that there was this time horizon out there of a Brexit coming, which basically forced you to lengthen your time horizon because if you didn't, you weren't going to be there after, after two years. The other point, though, which I think is, 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 is a really um, 
important one for people thinking of just what the, what the challenge is, particularly for SMEs and for, for Irish industry. There is no such thing as a European market. There are 27 markets out there. You have to penetrate that market. So the notion of, oh, you were selling into the UK, now go sell into Europe, as if Europe was a market. So in fact, the level of strategizing and investment, it's just something that I'm, I've often been struck by the way people sometimes slightly flippantly say, well, Irish industry should have been doing this, as if it's straightforward. But in fact, it's tactically around which of those markets do you go in, where in those markets do you, do you try to make your, 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 your new stakes. So this discussion is on the record so that everybody knows that. So now with that statement, can I open the floor to questions to anybody, including we can also go back and ask, ask um, Dahi whether he has, has, uh, has any further thoughts to make. But let me start the question here. <laughs> we can start the question here in the, in, in the middle. So. Is my name. I'm the Director of Retail Ireland. Uh, we're a division of IBEC. Um, firstly, uh, I suppose our interest most naturally is uh, within Edgar's paper uh, and indeed John's paper. Um, and I think firstly to welcome it. I think it's very important that we have the conversation about the potential impact upon the distribution sector and the retail sector. I think this, I'd agree with you. I think there's been probably uh, an underutilization of that conversation around what will happen to the, the domestic industries here uh, and those uh, industries and sectors that are reliant on imports. I think it's important and timely that we have that uh, conversation. I think the other missing piece of the jigsaw here is around the impact on the Irish consumer. Um, I think they've been notable in terms of their absence around what the, you know, the, the level of discussion we've been having since the vote in the UK uh, in terms of what the impact will be on them. There's been a lot of discussion again around exporting industries and the secondary impacts perhaps in terms of employment, etc. But you know, in terms of the, the money in people's pockets, what will happen there? I suppose the question I would have for Edgar is around the impact in terms of consumer sensi sensitivities, uh, in terms of price sensitivities, in terms of the elasticities of demand and without got disappearing down an economics rabbit hole, I suppose have efforts been made to explore that in terms of where is the tipping point, and I appreciate it'll be different across categories, but is there even a kind of blanket tipping point that we can look at in terms of where consumers will no longer take the pain of it, whatever the impact may be in terms of, of both tar tariff potentially and non-tariff barriers also, and what might that might look like. I suppose our companies at the minute are trying to do that individually to look and see, well, the products they're bringing into the state, what is the potential impact in terms of their cost base, uh, and how does that pass, how is that potentially passed on to a consumer? And, and I suppose I asked the question in the context of the last 10 years, which has been particularly difficult for Irish retailers in terms of recouping costs within the marketplace uh, and we do have a consumer that's absolutely reluctant uh, to accept price increases. So I'm just wondering has any effort been made to explore that and I suppose to put the consumer front and centre. Edgar, do you want to take directly? that? Yeah, please. Um, that's a good, very good question. Uh, our, our analysis is a product by product basis but obviously there are assumptions behind it and elasticities as you, as you say behind it. We have uh, a set of elasticities I think one would really like to do a bit more analysis on, on, some, uh, on those for the Irish market in particular. Uh, the other thing, of course, that's, that's very difficult to know uh, as a researcher standing back is how much of that uh, increase, uh, cost increase, will actually be passed through. Will it be all of it or will it be part of it? And that depends very much on competition. And I know you tend to think that there's a lot of competition in the Irish market because you've got a lot of individual retailers. But actually, in terms of the retail chains, the, the, the number of big uh, players, we actually have relatively little uh, competition. And if they're all hit by the same shock and they all pass on the price in the same way, it makes absolutely no difference except for the consumer. Uh, and so that's a question that, that, that is difficult to answer. Uh, uh, who, can, who can absorb some of it? Um, would they all be hit by the same shock? Obviously, the, the, le the percentage of, of goods that come from the UK differs by different chains. Uh, Tesco and Marks and Spencers probably have a greater share than the two German multiples. And so, and so on. So you, you get, you get uh, uh, you, there, there's a lot of detail to this. And yes, we, we, I think, need to do some more work to unpack that. Uh, you also asked about the consumer itself. Consumer sentiment is obviously uh, uh, influenced by, by things that are going on in the economy. We only looked at the, the first round effect of a price change. 
if you had simultaneously, as we have shown <coughs> elsewhere, uh, had an impact on GDP and incomes, you'd get a double whammy. Just, Edgar, just on that, is there anything known about, um, I'm just talking about a worst case scenario now, Brexit, and where we're trying to sell into the UK, is there anything known about the supply into the UK in terms of, I'm thinking food products in particular, that could come from non-EU? I mean, is that, is that, I mean, they must be estimating that because that's the relevant one for them, but that spills over onto us. It, you, you can look at this, and there, there's a, a second dimension to that, which is tastes. I, I often bring this up. I mean, I'm German, or, you know, I've been here a long time, but I am, I'm German. I grew up with, uh, I grew up near Dusseldorf, and Dusseldorf has its own kind of mustard. I like that stuff. My wife uh, grew up in Ireland, she's Irish, grew up in Ireland, she, she likes English mustard. So we have the mustard fight all the time. <laughs> and uh, of course you can only get the English stuff here, uh, so that's what we have. Uh, if you only like English mustard, you'll take the, the, the price increase, that's the way it'll be. So that, again, this is an important thing, uh, yeah. because tastes do differ, and that's actually the point you were making yeah. earlier about the 27 markets. Uh, if you're selling something successful in the UK, it doesn't necessarily mean that a German customer is going to buy it as well. Okay, question here on the right. Thank you very much for all of the presentations. Fantastic. Andy Maguire from the Dublin Institute of Technology. I'd like to pick up on one of Edgar's last points. It's a simple one, but it's an important one. That, you know, uh, Brexit will be bad. And it's to tie in with what Con was talking about, Con or, or the panel, um, and maybe Enterprise Ireland as well. The agri-food sector is, is our largest indigenous sector. It's tied to the land, along with tourism. Is, is, there, any, is there any good scenario for the agri-food sector over the coming decade, as far as Brexit is concerned? Or will they have to take a step back, do you believe? <coughs> well, I think, as I outlined the paper, they, like the, the, the best scenario would be the extremely soft Brexit. I mean, I noticed, for example, on Saturday, with the Financial Times were reporting what happened on Friday, they put the word soft in inverted commas. <laughs> so there's a lot of kind of loose talk around what's being soft. But I mean, when, even with, if the UK goes outside the customs union, that is a problem uh, sooner or later. So I mean, it would need a very benign situation of the UK to stay in the customs union or a green de facto, the same a bilateral customs union movement plus regulatory alignment. Now the regulatory alignment part of it seems to be probably the slightly easier part of it to, to get agreement on than the other part, not least because the UK seems to have hankered to this great ambition of doing independent trade deals, which mightn't be, um, mightn't be uh, that, that productive for them um, down, down the road. So. Okay, I'll just come in for a question to Joe. I, 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 just the, I mean, the, the issue of regulatory alignment, I think, really comes into the fore for how important it is for us, where we're exporting food and products across Europe, and we small companies who are doing it into many markets, and the idea is to diversify that further. If there were different standards in the UK, which remain still a significant market to us, to the continent, it would raise the cost base of our production here enormously. So it's, it's, it's a very, very significant one. I became conscious of this when I was in, involved in, in the Scottish government discussions because they, like us, export a lot of food products and, and alcohol products. And you just realise the extent to which common standards keep your production costs in four. If you've got to run multiple um, uh, lines of production in order to deal with different markets, your cost base absolutely shoots up. So it goes back to the taste piece again. Joe. At the risk of um, getting run off the stage with uh, Khan and Rowena, uh, mm -hmm. I, I would come at this from a, a climate policy perspective. And um, you know, two thirds of Irish beef farmers lose money. Um, it's a loss-making industry. Um, it adds very little. Um, well, it's certainly very little of the value is captured by farm families that are in business because of the common agricultural policy, which uh, sustains their lifestyle at the expense to the to the EU taxpayer. And so I could see Brexit. Uh, posing uh, a little bit of uh, more pressure on the agricultural sector to, you know, start to um, perhaps diversify, look at different opportunities um, in the different land use options uh, that are not necessarily locked in to doing something because we've always done it, or at least we've always done it since milk quotas were introduced in 1984 and doubled the size of the beef herd. 
um, and now we seem to think we have a divine right to kind of keep the beef herd at, the, at, that, at that level. So from my perspective, you know, there could be opportunities here to avoid paying uh, six billion in fines between 2020 and 2030 for failure to comply with our climate change targets if Brexit were to actually kind of incentivize a little bit of innovation in the agricultural sector. Rowena, wearing your former hat and indeed your present hat, both hats at the same time, a two-hatted person. Yeah, um, okay, <laughs> I'm probably responding more to what Joe said. Uh, two hats and no gloves. Um, yeah, I, the thing about it is um, there's a difference probably between um, uh, sectors quite rightly innovating, and I mean, I was speaking about it in, 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 my, in my speech, and, 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 and then I suppose the potential for changes to the rules of trade that would fundamentally do so much damage in the short term to a sector um, that wouldn't make sense. I mean, just in terms of where does uh, where, where, where the food sector sits in the Enterprise Ireland pantheon, our food companies, our Irish owned food companies represent 50% of Enterprise Ireland's exports. Like there, it's such an important sector economically to Irish owned enterprise and so while I absolutely recognize Joe, Joe's, uh, Joe's point there and the fact that we do need to be investing more uh, as a sector and, and, and throughout the food supply chain in a more sustainable means of production and so on, I, it's, it's hard to see the benefit of the UK market being, um, being a, a driver of innovation. I think it could just do so much damage in the short term if that market were cut off. So that would be why, uh, why I, would, I, would, I would unfortunately see for the agri-food sector, um, we need, uh, the sector needs a Brexit that uh, as far as is possible, keeps the UK market open and keeps the value of that market intact. Without the type of innovation that you were talking about. Chairman, can I also make a general point? I would like to re enter the frame. I think we could have a press course in determining whether farmers can survive without direct payments or not very quickly because, I mean, clearly the UK government has said they're going to leave the common agricultural policy, mm. like the GOV has a consultation process ongoing. But he has made, made it quite clear that the income support type direct payments, which are the biggest single component, of farm income there and here uh, will be will won't be any more, and what he's offering really are fairly selective income. Sorry, environment related direct payments. Mm -hmm. Now, even though they have a you know a better scale of farming in terms of the average size, I'm not too sure. I mean, I've looked at the the income data for the UK, and I tell you, when you take out the EU direct payments out of it, there isn't a lot left. So I think it will be an interesting observation, hopefully from our point of view, from the outside, to see what happens. Edgar, did you want to come back in? And then I've got something I, here. And it's, it's, a, it's a degree of bad. We're moving from a status quo to something that mm. is worse. Cool. And it ultimately is down to the outcome we're going to get from the negotiations, where we're going to end up. OK, one question here, one question here. Yeah. Niall Walsh, I'm a member of the Institute. Uh, diversification away from the British market was supposed to have started when we joined the EEC. And it did. It did. Actually, no, it's too gradual. slowly. It's Excuse slow, me. but it too did slowly. start. I'm may sorry, I, it did start. May I continue? Start. Uh, too slowly. <laughs> and yet we, 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 we arrive at, in 2018 and we don't have a proper motorway down to Ross Lair yet. And look at the state of the harbour down there. The second point is I'd like to make is that England is becoming a nastier country to, to live and work in. My daughter, who works in London, was recently called a foreigner. And some friends of mine who are French architects who have been working in London for the last six or eight years have recently returned to France because the atmosphere was, being, was becoming actually nastier. And the final point I'd like to make is Enterprise Ireland is fine when it comes to the big, sexy companies in Ireland, but micro SMEs are not getting the supports they desperately need. Okay, Thank I think, you. I think, Rowena, I think you. Yeah, I can. That's I can, firmly I'll, in your camp. I'll address two of those. I suppose Enterprise Ireland supports companies from 10 employees upwards, and the local enterprise office, which is a offices network, which supports further approximately 30,000 companies is for companies who have the ability or potential to export um, any below that. So 
our, I don't have our average size, but I know that the vast majority of the 5,000 companies I've mentioned are well below 50 employees. And as I said, we, we Enterprise Ireland supports companies at the, the, the 10 employees and up stage. So most of our companies fall into the small category of sector, not even into medium. Um, and, and I think it's very important as well. I, I was at a, a, a talk last week, you know, in terms of our supports available to small companies, where a, a, a company in, in Wicklow, Ventac, uh, they're, they're a fantastic company who are providing acoustic solutions. They have 50 employees, that's it. They are currently engaged in lean competitiveness supports to Enterprise Ireland. They're also engaged in doing some of the customs and logistics training we are talking about there. Because they have said, and it is something that maybe smaller companies, and I get it, would say, well, we don't have the time to be doing this or we can't put the resources behind it. What they have said is that by utilizing these supports, they are putting themselves in a position to be able to be more competitive <coughs> in any case, no matter what the outcome is. So I, I, I would contend that supports are there for small companies and the critical thing is that they are aware that they are there and that they would utilize them and see the value in utilizing them. Um, in terms of just the diversification piece and diversification um, should have happened and I know I had a response to this and diversification has happened, but uh, I may have to come back to it because there was, if you'd like to hear that for a second, Edgar, because I know I have, I have something okay. there on that. No, numbers. Um, yeah. Very quickly on diversification, uh, when Ireland joined, Ireland UK joined the EU or the EEC as it was then, uh, about 50% of Irish goods exports went to the UK, it's now 13, so it's, it, is, it has diversified and it's actually diversifying rapidly. Uh, when I first started looking at, at this, it was actually nearer 16, so it's actually even now, it, it, the share going to the UK is declining all the time. Um, the issue of the logistics side, uh, Ross Lair and the motorway, is an interesting one. The, the problem with the Ross Lair port and the direct, accent, direct route to France is that it is actually too long for uh, uh, most of the transport. And there, there are individual break points. Uh, uh, once you go beyond a certain number of hours, you just don't use that route. If it's perishables, for example, going directly to France is too slow. And so what could easily happen if we have enough impediments to transport through the UK for the, for the so-called land bridge, that some of our, our uh, exports to the rest of the EU will actually stop because you can't get them to market. If you're selling oysters from Carlingford, for example, they need to have arrive on, on a shelf in, in, in France or in Germany or wherever with a shelf life. And as you take a day off, and it only needs to be, the day only, only needs to be started. As you take a day off, you lose that shelf space. Uh, and so just going to Ross Lair and going from there isn't, isn't going to be a solution to all the issues. There will be sectors and products that cannot go that way. Uh, and so we, we, what that means is it's going to be very important to negotiate something for land bridge that we basically don't face any new impediments to our exports going through the UK. And there are already existing arrangements there. There's, a, there's a, an EU, a, a UN uh, uh, convention, for example, a TIR convention, 1976, which is in place, and the UK is a signatory. So there are some things that can be done in this space. And my criticism of the UK government is they didn't come up front with things that the low-hanging fruit, where they could simply say, "We're going to solve that." That's 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 not a worry. Um, maybe they will now that they change tack. Back to Rena briefly. Just, um, I suppose, one thing that I, always strikes me about this debate about market diversification, and it should have happened more quickly, and so on. When you look at any evidence and any economic evidence as to what countries should do or companies should do when they're first exporting, it's go to your nearest neighbour who has the same taste as you, who speaks the same language as you and so on. So to be critical of Irish companies to have continued to export into the UK, I think isn't, isn't fair to them, frankly. What has, what, and there has been a lot of diversification and there has been such efforts made, particularly in the last number of years, faced now with this change that no, you know, that, that, that could not have been anticipated and should not have been anticipated to try and help companies in what will be a difficult challenge to diversify into new markets. I just wanted to make that point because I don't think Irish companies 
were exported to the UK out of laziness or anything like that, there's very good economic reasons why that trade pattern would have continued. And Edgar has written a lot on the gravity model, which would show we should always be exporting and importing a lot from our nearest neighbour. That goes, goes, I think, with, with, without saying. It is a question, though, in terms of portfolio. You want to be as diversified as possible, particularly when your next door neighbour is, is having difficulties working out a coherent economic strategy for the future. It's a wise, wise place to be. Question over here. Hi, uh, Brian Barry. Brian Barry from IFA, so I, <laughs> I have a question, but I'll make my comment before the question comes, just uh, on Joe's comment, because, I mean, our, you know, we are conscious of, and I, and I know Joe has contributed to this significantly, we are conscious of climate change as a very important issue, there are important signals there that we read and that we're working on, but, you know, the beef sector contributes a massive amount to this economy, uh, it doesn't make Except it's not a, a very profitable enterprise for a lot of farmers. Fully accept that, but it is extremely important in terms of the levels of economic activity, especially around the regions. Um, and something that cannot be forgotten, can ever, cannot ever be forgotten in this debate, is if we reduce our production of beef, you know, it's not going to reduce the demand for beef. That, you know, they're not tied together. The demand will simply be supplied from somewhere else. And if it is supplied, and this is where it's most likely to be supplied, from South America, from Brazil, their carbon footprint per kilo of beef is between three and four times ours. Those are reasonable facts. Now, we'll move on from that and I'll move to what the question was. The question, the question actually relates to, and it's a comment and a question to Khan, to regulatory alignment, and I think, um, I think the Chequers statement and whatever should follow, and an awful lot of what the British government has said has been shrouded in spin, but there's enough material in what they've said in the Chequers statement on regulatory alignment to make it a significant move, a very significant move. Um, I'm not saying it's perfect, but it is substantial. Now, it's only on goods, it's not on services. Um, and okay, there is a parliamentary lock thrown in there, you know, but this is an offer in negotiations. Uh, so I just asked Con what he thinks in that area, because to be honest, if regulatory, uh, and Connor's pa Con's paper is an excellent paper, of course, and he has been highlighting these issues for months and putting them into the public domain and privately also, and I want to recognize that the work that he's done, but they are somewhere between option A and option B, and we need to move them closer to option A, obviously, and that's where the customs area that we're not going to get into here, uh, we'll wait for the white paper on that comes in, but I just wanted to ask Con maybe just to, to comment on that. I would think it's a substantial move. Um, it's, we're not there yet on that area, but it's a substantial move. Con. Yes, I tend to agree, I think it's it's not often that your opponent concedes something substantial like that as, you know, as well as some, not that early, but relatively early stage in the, in, the, in the negotiations. I mean, there are two problems I see. One is just the issue that Brian referred to, the question of the, 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 the British Parliament, you know, being able or needing to copper fast or whatever. I mean, what happens if they disagree with something? then it seems to fall apart very quickly. The other issue, I think, is that, I mean, the my understanding of regulatory alignment is talking really about the, the non-tariff side of the trade, the non-tariff yeah. barriers. I mean, they're still, no, I, I'm not, I haven't checked the, the new paper yet, but I mean, I think there's probably a lot less commitment from the UK on the tariff side, particularly what they say about collecting customs duties on mm -hmm. behalf of the EU, mm -hmm. which I suppose the EU won't agree to anyway. Yeah. But I mean, I think there still may well be, 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 be tariff barriers. But I mean, as, as Doyle said at the beginning, it, it is a significant step in progress. And like, I think, well, to, to, to generalize for a minute, I mean, looking over the big, the big picture, I mean, the UK won the, 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 the money argument uh, you know, very well, more or less, fairly quickly up front on transition, which is a big issue. The UK accepted uh, the EU offer basically 
So uh, it looks like taking a, a positive view of this thing that the UK, you know, will concede more to get to get an agreement, at least in, in certain circumstances. Uh, I, I put, I mean, only time will tell. But could I just make one point though? Well, I just have to floor there's something that's maybe a bit um, hasn't been commented on so far, and that is the risk of we nothing it. There not being a withdrawal agreement agreed by the end of this year. Well, then, most importantly, the transition arrangement falls apart. So we're, I mean, if things go wrong, we're actually dangerously close to the cliff edge. Yeah. And I mean, that's what I think we'll all be watching very closely in October and very shortly afterwards. And there isn't much time after October. Could I bounce that? question a bit to die just for comment on but also do you think there's some significance that services wasn't mentioned in the paper because I would have thought the UK has a big incentive to have an alignment on the services side particularly as far as financial services is concerned I mean the last thing they want is to be to be locked out of a lot of things so I'm just wondering has that been kept for the white paper I don't know is the answer yeah um, I think lots of people were were surprised that it yeah. wasn't wasn't there um, I think you've got, I mean, just look, whilst we've been here, Boris Johnson is gone. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, she's in a very, very difficult political position. And to mm -hmm. have, I think to have got it as far as she got it at Chequers, it may, have, it may have been just a bit too far at this time. Yeah. There is a real possibility of a cliff edge. Okay, now I'm watching our time because we're due to finish up here in approximately six minutes. Uh, Edgar, do you have a 30 second point to make? Services. If you look at CETA, the Canadian-Europe agreement, at the end of seven years, seven products are subject to tariff quotas, but a whole host of services don't trade freely. Yeah. And when you look at it, even the Canadian provinces have exemptions on individual services, and that's where the individual countries, as Dahi mentioned earlier, yeah. that's when they're going to come in. Yeah, because that was, I think that was the big break through the single market. Yeah. Dan, very quick question. Thanks, Dan O'Brien from the Institute. Uh, Dahi, I suppose, to you, but anybody else. Um, the, the hard Brexiteer people, it, does their desire for, for a hard Brexit, is it, is it greater than their fear of Corbyn? So, in other words, what do you think? Will they bring the government down now? <laughs> oh, no, I think, I, think, I think now, this, you have to think now that there's going to be forced to a vote. Mm. Uh, she's going into the 1922 committee, I think, later today. Um, do they have the numbers? They probably do at this stage. Um, I mean, I said earlier on that I was very surprised that Boris Johnson didn't go first. I was. But there's obviously been a lot of pressure put on him. And so I think the situation may have changed just in the last few hours. Uh, there may be a leadership channel. Yeah, he's been the hand around for leadership. So, to answer your question, is Brexit more important to them than Corbyn? Possibly. Um. I'm just going to draw this to a close because it's a, everybody's been incredibly patient. This is the warmest afternoon <laughs> to be in any space like this imaginable and people have been enormously patient and, 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 the, and the gentlemen in the room on the panel have managed to keep their jackets on, which I don't know how they did. But they, they have done it. Uh, and their ties in, in three out of four cases. Uh, but but um, <laughs> uh, I think it's, it's really been a fantastic opportunity to hear Dahi today talking about exactly where we are. This story, unfortunately, will run and run, and there'll be different elements into it at different stages. But it's fantastic to get an opportunity to hear the interpretation of that time and to be able to reflect on somebody who's been looking at the area for a very long time. I think the three Institute papers released uh, have been hugely valuable. They cover three very important areas. Not everybody wants to know about energy markets, electricity markets, and the like. I spent four years on the board of Board Gosh, and I, I, around the time actually this was coming in, and they were preparing for it. So I actually, I've had my major dose of it over the years, but it's not everybody's cup of tea. We all can connect with retailing and distribution, which I think is, 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 is something that's very, and of course we can all correct with agri-food. And then on top of that, we'd Rina giving a, a, a um, I suppose, an indication of what the state can do. I think the state now quite rightly recognizes that the amount it can do in these areas is quite marginal. It can help and assist, but ultimately it's about business, it's about innovation, it's about people risk-taking. And just one point to say, in the reverse of the sort of, not so much the gravity model which tells you about you where your trade would be, but about entry into new markets. I think that, that information technology and the web and the, all of that has made the possibility of entering into new markets at more distance 
greater distance become more possible. So the idea of companies being born global now if they have the right supports is there, whereas historically everything, you know, you would always be told to sell in your next market, in your next market, in your next market. So there's lots, lots, lots more to be said on this topic. Thank you all for coming this afternoon. I think all of you got copies of the papers, and I'd like to thank the panel members for their contribution. Thank you.